Well, a few weeks ago when we first started talking about what was going on in Ferguson, you heard Jim Flink mention that one of our students, Ryan Schisler, was there working as a freelance reporter for Al Jazeera's website. He wrote four stories and contributed to several others, which brought about some of the context we hadn't seen in other reports. He wrote about how the African-American community moved to Ferguson after being forced out of Kinlock for airport expansion that never materialized. He wrote about a hip-hop radio station that turned to an all talk format to give people a voice during the protests, and he wrote about Ferguson residents working to clean up their neighborhood after looting. And once he decided he couldn't take it anymore, he wrote a personal blog post about why his time reporting from Ferguson was over, for now at least. In it, he described seeing news photographers taking bricks from retaining walls to weigh down broadcast tents, others yelling at residents to clear out from their camera shots, even others making it entirely about themselves. He recalled specifically a journalist who said he'd come to the scene because that journalist viewed it as a networking opportunity, then handed Ryan a camera asking if he would take a photo with CNN's Anderson Cooper. Ryan is a very familiar face to those of us here at RJI. He's been a student of mine for more than three years, and I knew he'd made this decision. He'd contacted me at several points during his time in Ferguson looking for help and advice. Honestly, I wasn't going to bring this up to talk about today because I am so close to the situation, but longtime views of the news host, Rod Gillette, sent it to me yesterday, not realizing that we know Ryan. And I thought we really should talk about it at that point. Um, I want to ask you, what's what are your reactions to some of the things he's, he's said, he's seen, and he's decided on how to act from there? Well, I'm, I, I just want to commend him for, for actually doing this. I mean, these are things that happen at, at instance, incidents like this all the, all the time. And but very seldom the public doesn't know that this is going on. Mm -hmm. And so I want to commend him for that. Uh, I also want to, you know, just take an opportunity to to talk about how journalists need to think about their own actions in incidents like this. I mean, you're there to provide news and information to the public in a way that sh that provides context and authenticity to the story. And, and oftentimes what I've seen in, in a lot of journalism these days is journalists becoming part of the story. And them becoming a part of the story sort of takes it away from what I think should be the authentic frame from which the information you're providing. And to me, it's just shoddy journalism and a lack of, of understanding and a lack of, of supervision on the part of some editors and, and some, some producers in reining this in. And it just becomes a circus. And we keep talking about this over and over again where you see all these live trucks and, and all these cameras set up and, and, and networks going live with their morning shows and this sort of thing. And it becomes... It becomes entertainment, and this isn't entertainment. This is these people are living their daily lives in this, and they have they are trying to create a voice that I think the rest of the, the of that neighborhood and the rest of that city needs to hear. If you look at the comments below Ryan's mm -hmm. blog, you'll post you'll see that it's overwhelmingly positive with people basically <laughs> saying thank you for sharing this with us. We wish you were still here and covering the story. And on that latter comment, I'll have to say, reading the stories that he contributed to Al Jazeera, very good reporting, especially I like the piece about Kinlock. Now, that mm -hmm. came from an original, I think, documentary or longer piece that, that Al Jazeera had done previously. But that he Ryan built had, on yes, it. that Ryan had worked right. on. But this, And the story, you know, basically looking at the people in the community, the residents who were trying to protect the stores and clean up the stores after looting, you didn't hear that from a lot of places, a few, but that was a really great story. So I, I do wish he were still able and willing to be there to cover more of the stories that he has already produced. People who said, you know, uh, there were some critics who suggested, well, he was making the story all about him. I don't think so. I do think he was genuinely shocked. And if you look at senior journalists who've been around for a while, yeah. I think we're kind of inured to some of the how the sausage is made. And totally. we think we can divorce that yeah. from what we put out on the air or in, in publication. And he didn't. And it, having a fresh perspective on some of the things that journalists do that people do notice is a good thing. Yeah, I think I think also part of it is that, I mean, he was willing to basically air journalism's dirty laundry, yeah. so to speak. 
And that was where a lot of the criticism came. But I think that they really need to 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 pol- start policing themselves in instances like this. There was one question uh, that was raised by a few folks, uh, including Jay Rosen at NYU, yeah. a media ethicist, basically. About, should he we should name have named names. names. So do you think it would have been more effective had he... Uh, I don't know if it would have been more effective or not. I think it would have caused people to focus on the individual personalities and and drive whatever agendas that was going to do. I thought the story wasn't about n- individuals. It was about, you know, the, the, the behavior of journalists in general at the scene. And so I personally would not have named the names. I can see why from a perspective of trying to authenticate what he was saying, it might have been useful, but I don't think it would help that much.